I want to talk about a couple things. Uh, th this research really only uh, took flight in April uh, when the board, the, the IPR Board of Trustees, approved uh, uh, the start of this research um, uh, program. And to really think about that, we are right at the beginning of this. We're at the bottom of the hill and we're looking up and trying to understand where we go forward. There's been a lot of great work that has been done over the years in the fields of cognitive psychology and behavior and neuroscience and marketing. But in our field, we are pretty silent on that. So we set out, we set some parameters and, and said, look, we, we can't do it all. We can't, in fact, in six months, tackle all the research. We want to do a sampling of different articles and different uh, areas of, of research. And so the area was to come back and to start to map and start to look at a number of them. Uh, and then to look at the connections. Where are the connections in the field that the research has identified? And, and some of them, as we talked about, are in these fields of crisis communications. Uh, especially some of the work even that Tim Coombs has done in terms of apologies and how organizations respond and why some organizations do so well and set a benchmark and others fail miserably. Health communications obviously is a great and important area. Uh, how we change behavior and understanding about healthy lifestyles or choices that we make. Uh, consumer behavior obviously is one that we want to look at. But we wanted to in fact narrow that pretty quickly um, because of time and because of the, um, the vast amounts. And so what we really focus is on the cognitive effect of and, and affect of the communicator themselves. Well, are there certain aspects, attributes of the communicator that, that allow us to, in fact, influence behavior in a, in a meaningful way? The research tells us that it's just not that simple. Just writing a good story with good characters isn't that simple. In fact, there's three different parts of this narrative that we have to be familiar with. First of all, we have to truly understand the receiver. We have to do our research about what the receiver perceives as important in terms of story identification as well. Do they, are they familiar with the story? Are they paying attention to the story? And those of us who teach understand that uh, every day. Most of it, in fact, with the distractions, the technological distractions that are there. Is there a need for an affect? Do they need to, in fact, feel a part of it? And if they don't, what happens? If I don't feel associated with that? And is there a need for cognition? Do I really have to understand? Do I have to have some sense of what's going on as well? Then the story itself has to have great characters. Right? It has to have fluency. It has to be crafted really well. It has to be structured, and it has to have a specific discord. And then the third part that has to be present is this sense of cultural embeddedness. Right? that it then, in fact, has to have the content that is culturally familiar to the receivers in a language or terminologies that make sense to them as well. If you have those three levels of components available to us, then we allow ourselves to be, in fact, transported to the sense of identification. And if the identification happens, then we, in fact, become one with it. We reference to it, we take our perspectives from it, and we begin to impact, uh, we incorporate that into our social being as well. If we do that, then we, in fact, engage in this narrative persuasion and we move towards behavioral change. Uh, so first, a confession on your part. How many of you, and be honest, out of a guilty pleasure, have watched anything to do with the Kardashians? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, come on. Because there's an app out there that's huge too, right? How many of you have watched anything to do with any of the Real Housewives franchise? Yes, thank you for being honest. Now I'm going to horrify you. Seven years ago, I entered a realm of curiosity as a curse. Once you get interested in something and can't put it down and start studying, and 1,100 pieces of research later, I find a piece of research out of Germany by a man named Marcus Appel. It's, it's called reading about stupid people can make you stupid. <laughs> and this is the power of narrative transport. That when you delve into this, you discover that immersion in an effective narrative is so powerful that in this piece of research, they tested people before and after. And they found that after you were immersed in the character of an idiot, your test scores plunge. Your own test scores plunge. So I beg you to rethink the cold Kardashian real housewives. 